Receive one of them, raise your hand. Brother John is coming around. Brother Edwin did not get one. Anybody else? Fantastic. And thank you, ladies. Thank you again for the food. That was delicious. Amen. I enjoyed that much. The, the baked potato with some little bit of chili and sour cream and cheese. That hit the spot. I enjoyed that very much. Now, that's uh, one of the first announcements. Tomorrow's service will be at 6 o'clock. We're going to move it up an hour so that we in turn make sure you get plenty of sleep on tomorrow night. Be ready for Sunday. And also, I'm sad to announce there's no meal for tomorrow night. And everybody said, isn't that sad? And so, uh, <clears throat> no meal for tomorrow night. We're going to take a break. So you'll have to fast, I guess, tomorrow or figure out something else. And then <clears throat> Sunday, we'll uh, be back here in our place. We're not going to have any meal on Sunday either. It's actually here for the church. And I also want to remind you, there's an offering plate in the back. If you'd like to give a donation to our preacher, then it's there on the back chair. And some encourage you to do that. James chapter 4, right in the middle of the page. Will you read it with me, please? Everybody together. James 4, verse number 8. Everybody together, please. Ready? Begin. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. And purify your hearts. Hold on just a minute. I, I cut and pasted that. I, that doesn't sound right, does it? And it's draw nigh to God. Who in the world did this? Miss Debbie, did you do this? Says Miss Debbie. Yeah. Anyway, draw nigh to God. Okay. All right. So uh, just change out the near for nigh. Near for nigh. Draw nigh to God. And he will draw nigh to you. Okay. So let's read it again. Everybody together. Ready? Begin. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands. You double-minded. All right. Ladies, will you read for me, please? Ready? Begin. Draw nigh to God. God. All right, man, your turn. Ready? Begin. Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. All right, all the young people, 19 years and younger, all of them together, good, loud voice. Ready? Begin. Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, all right, all of us together once more. Ready? Begin. Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Good verse for us to remember tonight. Good to have Pastor Reinhardt here today and his wife. Well, it's good to have her too, her too as well. So thank you so much for being here. All right, well, we're going to have singing in page 51 in your song book. Page 51, Brother Mark's going to lead us. Brother Bob is, Brother Mark's pinch hitting for Brother Bob tonight. We're glad he's here, but he's not quite up to par to lead in song. So stand with me at your feet, and let's start off by singing page 51 in your song book.
7.14, if my people who are called by my name shall, say it with me, humble themselves. We talked about that the first night. And say it with me and pray. That's what we talked about last night. And the third, we see ingredient here that uh, was mentioned in this passage is seek my face. And we understand this is a, a promise, an answer to the prayer for Solomon, a promise to give to the children of Israel. And though it doesn't directly apply to us, we know these ingredients are always included in that person who wants to find themselves in God's presence and right with Him. And so here, the third thing mentioned is seek my face. Really what it's saying is, the word face is to seek His presence. Seek His presence. And that's interesting because we know that God is here tonight. Amen? Amen? We know that. We know. David even said that if I were to make my bed in hell, you would be there. We know that God is all places. But God's presence with us is one matter. Our presence with Him is another matter. There's a lot of people who pretend as though God doesn't exist and though He's not even there. There's a lot of Christians that acting as though that God can't see what they're doing. Remember the story of Jonah? The Bible says he fled from the presence of the Lord. Well, we know that's not possible. But in Jonah's mind, he thought that he was going to a place where God could not see, where God in turn would not give account to what he was doing. Now here, the writer, uh, the writer in Second Chronicles said, if we, we in turn, the Lord is saying to us, if we want to find ourselves revived, then we need to humble, we need to pray. But thirdly, here it says that we need to seek His face. We need to purposely come into the presence of God. Our verse tonight that we read, James chapter 8, 4 verse number 8, draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. And so tonight, I want to be in the presence of God. And I believe you do as well. We've enjoyed the preaching this week, enjoyed the singing, enjoyed the food too, amen? That's been good as well. And so, but I want to be. And that's a promise that God gave us. If two or three were gather in my name, I will be in the midst. If we've gathered here to be in His presence, for His behalf, to see Him, to hear from Him, then the Lord promises that He would make Himself known unto us. And so, let's have time of prayer. Men, if you'll come forward and find your place on the altar and the platform to pray. And ladies, if you will, there where you're at, then bow your heads. And let's ask the uh, Lord, let the Lord know we're seeking Him today. We're seeking His presence.
be here tonight. Lord, we don't want to waste the time. Lord, we, we want to have left here tonight knowing that we as a church family were in your presence. We pray, Father, that you would convict us and comfort us and encourage us as needed. We pray for your power to rest upon the preaching of your word, that you'd be magnified and you'd magnify your words in our presence. Lord, please, we trust you. And being in your presence, Father, is so endearing. It's We know, Father, that you want, you want, you'll treat us gently and that you want what's best for us. You'll care for us. And Lord, we, we submit ourselves to you tonight and pray that you would please, please meet with us in an unusual way. Good, you're faithful, you're just, you're holy, you're almighty, you're our God, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As men walk back, can you sing with me, please, this scripture song? Everybody together. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. He's going to lead us in a song here or sing for us and then brother chris you're up you come on up here and you preach for us and i uh, want to i meant to mention this to you on the bottom of the sheet there's other people there to remember to pray for i know you do but i just want to help us in remembering brother becca called me again today before the service and he wanted me to say again is almost every service he said tell the church i love them i miss them and thank you so much for all the cards and the, the kindness that you show them Okay, you ready, brother? I think I'm going to sit. <laughs> that seems easier. I heard this song uh, years ago at a revival. <laughs> brother Cleve Al, some of you know Cleve. He preached a message on uh, the three people on the cross. I'll never forget that message. One died in their sin. One died to sin. And we know, thanks be to God, Christ died for our sin. Amen. Amen. The song is called Three Men on the Mountain. Three men on the mountain.
amongst yourselves and get this stuff out of the way. <laughs> Give Chris some room. I think I'm on back there. Preacher told me to make sure it's working. Is that working? All right. Nehemiah chapter 8 again in your Bibles. Thank you again for the good fellowship and food. I'm fed up. And, uh, I ate enough that I think is pushing against my lungs and can't breathe very well. And that might be strategic so I don't preach so long tonight. Uh, I'll do my best to mind the Lord. But it's been a joy to be with you and, and get to know some of you in fellowship and uh, especially the time of fellowship and around the Word of God. It's uh, been a blessing to my heart. I sure appreciate what the Lord's been doing uh, in my life through, the, through this Bible. Nehemiah chapter 8 again, please, tonight, and we'll move on into chapter 9 if uh, the Lord sees fit. We've been talking about the one revival in Scripture that uh, wasn't promoted or prompted by a man or a prophet. There wasn't an apostle or <clears throat> an evangelist stirring the people up uh, toward this thing, but the Bible said the people gathered themselves. They desired God. <clears throat> they sought God. They, uh, they stood for hours as the Word of God was read and explained. They took it to heart. They responded. And uh, the results of this revival are incredible. <clears throat> and uh, look at Nehemiah 8, if you will, in, in verse uh, number 9. Nehemiah 8 in verse number 9, the Bible said, Nehemiah, which is a Tershatha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. We talked last night, this day, this ordinary day, turned into a holy day. It wasn't one on the calendar, but it became that in their lives. And the Bible says here, Mourn not, nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. I think it's probably safe to say that it's been a long time for some of us, maybe many of us, since we've heard a sermon and uh, heard about some sin in our lives and then shed tears because we've come short of God's glory. Probably been a while. Been a long time since we've wept because we failed to live in accord with the Scriptures. Look at verse 10. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared for this day is holy unto our Lord, neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Hold your peace, for the day is holy, neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth, because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. And so we see they have this great mirth, they have joy, they're uh, finding strength in that joy, they have deliverance from their sorrows and deliverance from their grief. But something I want you to notice tonight, just in passing is their response or their action. <clears throat> they're, they're weeping and uh, rightly so. They are, they are uh, troubled and rightly so and so they're weeping and when the preacher reminds them that God has been good to them and God has been merciful to them and uh, gracious to them and he put away their sin and the preacher says don't, don't weep but rejoice they immediately stop weeping and start rejoicing. And I find that peculiar. I've I've never seen a generation like the one we live in that can't seem to control or govern their emotions. And uh, when God's Word had its way in these people's lives, in their hearts and their lives, they could turn off the grief and turn on the joy. They could turn off the despair and turn on the gladness. They could set the sorrow aside here and immediately they had great mirth. And here we are in this generation, my generation, they have surrendered to their emotions and they have surrendered to their feelings. It's as if there was no, I'm talking about in the church. It's as if there was no God. It's as if there was no Holy Spirit. There's no power whatsoever in Jesus Christ. And uh, I deal with people who put more trust in shrinks and medication than they do the Almighty God that saved them and they can actually do so. You know, He's risen from the dead and can do something in their lives. I wouldn't recommend you go home and try something drastic, but I would recommend you try something that some would call drastic. And that's to trust God with your feelings like you trust God with your soul. And uh, there's, there's plenty in this world to be sad about. We understand that. There's plenty in this world to be happy about. 
There's plenty in this world and, you know, the Christian life to weigh you down. There's plenty in the Christian life that can take you to the mountaintop. Uh, these people opted to go higher. These people opted. They chose to rejoice and experience the joy of the Lord. They turned the tears off and they got happy. And uh, not that happiness is all that matters, but I do believe what's going on is a mark of real revival. Mm -hmm. Nehemiah 8 and verse 13, watch it. And on the second day, again, they came back. That's a wonder. On the second day were gathered together the chief of the fathers and of all the people, the priests and the Levites unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. They got this desire for more truth. Then in verse 14 through 17, they worked to bring themselves into conformity with the Word of God. Look at verse 14. <clears throat> and they found written in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses, we spoke about this last night, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month, and that they should publish and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go forth unto the mountain, fetch olive branches, and pine branches, and myrtle branches, and palm branches, and branches of thick trees, to make booths as it is written. So the people went forth and brought them and made themselves booths, everyone upon the roof of his house and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the street of the water gate and in the street of the gate of Ephraim and all the congregation of them that were come again, at, come again out of the captivity made booths and sat under the booths for since the days of Jeshua the son of Nun unto that day had not the children of Israel done so and there was very great gladness. We talked about last night they had not observed correctly the feast of tabernacles for somewhere around a thousand and 50 years. And uh, here they are in verse 17. The Bible says now they're doing it right. And there was very great gladness. Verse 18. Also day by day from the first day unto the last he read in the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast, of se the feast seven days. And on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according to the manner. Now look at chapter 9 if you will. Verse 1. Now on the 20 and fourth day of this month the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloths and earth upon them. Them. The seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. They stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day. And another fourth part they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. So, you've got to get the picture here. After three hours of preaching, we might would call it, and three hours of dealing with this sin in their heart, or dealing with this preaching in their heart, and three hours, you know, three hours of hearing the Word of God, three hours of doing something with what they've heard, that's a change, by the way. Mm -hmm. Hearing something, then doing something about it. Now watch, watch verse 1 again. Now on the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting. There are free, frequent references in the Old Testament of people who fasted, uh, people who gave up food, and in some cases food and water, food and drink. Jesus, remember when his, his disciples, when they asked his, why he, you know, why his disciples didn't fast, he said, "It's because I'm here." And he said, "But when I'm taken away, then shall my disciples fast. They'll fast after that." Yet, strangely, I find you can correct me if I'm wrong later, but I don't find in either testament a place that commands fasting. It's not one verse of Scripture that I can think of in the Old Testament before the law or under the law. There's not one verse of Scripture in the Gospel age or the New Testament era where God commands His people to fast. In fact, the Lord ordained somewhere seven feast days for Israel and zero fast days, which means this. It was completely voluntary. This was not something that anyone has to do. And here are these people. They have now spent seven days Without you know, with their house over here, and uh, the comforts over here, and uh, they're living in a booth made of branches from trees that they've cut down and woven together. They've spent seven days now sleeping on the ground, not in their bed. They've spent seven days in the elements, not in the shelter of their home. They've spent seven days out there. Now, at the end of this seven days, they come up with this idea: God has been so good to us. Let's not eat. Let's not. Uh, God has blessed us so much. Let's not spread a feast, but let's go hungry. Now, they didn't have to do that. They wanted to do that. 
Watch the next step. The Bible says the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloth. It means just what it says. They went out and got sacks. If, you, if you've never experienced sackcloth, go down to your local feed store, wherever you have things like that, and get a feed bag or some burlap, and uh, you go get one of those old rough, prickly, scratchy bags that the feed comes in, and just roll your sleeves up and rub it on your arm for a moment, and uh, you'll understand, you'll feel the irritation from that bag in just a minute. I remember I do upholstery. I've done upholstery since I was 17 years old, and uh, any of you know what a rat rod is, just an old vehicle, old truck or whatever, and they fix them up, but kind of rough looking. A friend of mine got me to put old tobacco sacks on the seats, and uh, I can remember working with that burlap, and for days, the itchiness and the abrasiveness that was in my arms and my hands from messing with that material through that. And uh, you find as you read your Bible throughout the Old Testament when people seem like they really wanted to get a hold of God, they put on sackcloths. It's not because it made God hear them, but it's because it made them pray. And not because God looked down and said, man, they're, they're hurting. Here's 10 extra points. No, here's why. When you come into the church this evening in your comfortable clothes, when we move, we don't, we don't think about it. When I move up here preaching, I'm not hurting. My legs are not responding with pain from my clothing. I'm moving my arms. I'm not saying, ouch, I'm comfortable. These people would put on sackcloths for the same reason that they would fast. Does not make you more spiritual. Does not make you any more godly. It doesn't get you any closer to God. But if you decided tonight that I'm going to go 24 hours without eating, you'll be amazed at how often you eat. And you'll be amazed if you say I'm going to go 48 hours with eating. You'll be amazed at how much this body loves food and just craves it. And the reason that people would fast in Bible times is so that their every time their belly said I want something, they'd be reminded to pray. Every time their body craves some food, they'd be reminded to pray. And every time their belly said, if you don't feed me right now, I'm going to kill you. You turn to God and you say, God, I'm going to die here if you don't help me. It causes you to pray. And the purpose of fasting was not to make God hear you, it was to make you talk to Him. And the purpose of sackcloth was not to get God's ear, but it was, a, it was to get you to open your mouth. Every time you'd move, you'd be irritated by that sackcloth and you would say to yourself, man, I'm this irritating to God. I'm this, my ways are this abrasive to my Heavenly Father, I need to pray. It caused them to pray. And then they did a third thing. Watch it, chapter 9, verse 1 children of Israel were assembled with fasting, with sackcloths, and earth upon them. It's one of those weird phrases in your Bible. There are several gestures that, you, gestures that you read about in the Old Testament that are kind of strange, at least to our modern day thinking. A man would smite upon his breast. It was a symbolic gesture of taking a knife and stabbing himself in the heart. A man in the Bible would rend his clothes, and the idea is, I'm, I'm torn asunder. My, my, I'm torn asunder, and people then would also so right here we see it, they would throw dirt upon themselves. It was like they were saying, I'm as good as in the grave. I'm a, I'm a dead man. I should be six feet under. Now here we are, New Testament church, New Testament church age, living under grace. You say, I don't have to do any of that stuff. I know. I understand that. Here's what I find so striking is that when these people sought God and these people sought the Word of God and these people paid attention to the Word of God and took the Word of God to heart, they suddenly found themselves doing things that they didn't have to do. And they found themselves uh, going farther than what God required them to do in His Word. And they suddenly said, I've done all that was commanded of me and I'm still an unprofitable servant because I've only done my duty. Surely God deserves more than what he's ordered me to do. They said, we want to go farther. Now, I have to look at my life before I preach to you. I don't think you can preach without doing that, but I want you to look at your life this evening. And I think it's a, I think it's a fact that once that initial thrill of salvation begins to fade and once those years set in and those troubles and those trials and those frustrations of life set in, is it not true that at least in our heart we begin to echo the words of our old man? The words that we spoke before we got saved. You know, why do I have to do that? 
and uh, why do I, you know, why do I have to go that far? Or what's what's wrong with that? Or I, I know a lot of saved people that do that. There there are plenty of churches that God is blessing, and they don't take it to the extremes that our church takes it to. Why why do we have to be called a cult? I told somebody a while back, somebody called our church a cult. I said, No, we're not a cult. If we were a cult, we wouldn't let you leave. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, <laughs> these people on this day they got so full of God and they got so full of God's word and they brought their lives into such obedience to the scriptures at least for one week that at the end of that week they wanted to push themselves to go beyond even what God had commanded them. They didn't have to fast but they did. They didn't have to put on sackcloths but they did. They didn't have to cast dirt upon themselves but they did. Why? Because it was, it was so good to be so close to God that they were doing all they could do to figure out a way to try to get closer. They were so full of joy. They were so full of gladness. In fact, the Bible said we talked about it uh, the first night, and there was very great gladness. And the people said, man, if it's, if it's, if it's this good keeping God's commandments, how, how good would it be? How wonderful would it be if we just went all out and became super fanatics? Let's quit eating and pray. Let's put on sackcloths and we'll call on God. Let's cast dust upon our heads and, and uh, live like dead men. It's very interesting. It grabs my attention. Now watch that. Keep, keep your finger there, if you will. Matthew chapter number 5. We'll read a few other places in the Scripture tonight. I'm going to show you a passage of Scripture here in Matthew chapter number 5 that uh, most likely we've never applied in this context. I had always, and every time I've read this, I'd always used it in relation to other people. But let's look at this Scripture in relation to God tonight. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 38. Matthew 5 and verse 38. You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. And I've always heard this, and even in my own life, I've always applied this to our neighbors and to our fellow church members and you know how far do you go for other people let's apply it to Jesus Christ wonder tonight what if he took your career plans would you let him take more what if he what if he took a family member would you come back and offer him the other cheek what if, uh, what if he took your health? Would you come and, and say, Lord, here I am, sackcloth, dirt all over me, fasting. What else do you want, Lord? I'm telling you, in those early days after we got saved, we would walk through hell if Jesus asked us to. We wanted to do any, but, you know, the years go on, and, and he did this to me, and this happened in my family, and this happened in our church, and this prayer didn't get answered, and I didn't get, you know, this didn't go my way the way I wanted it to go, and I have now reserved a cheek for me that I'm I'm not going to give to God because the last time I gave him a cheek it hurt. Are we all right? Can we be that honest? It was Friday night and Friday, Friday night talking about revival. The Bible says, look at verse 40 there. If any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Seems like from reading this that it was legally justified. They go to court, they present the case, and the judge said, you owe that man your coat. Jesus said, why don't you take off your cloak and just throw that in with the deal? Did the Lord save you? When he saved you, did he take away your old life? Why don't you just give him your new life too? Why don't you just, did, you know, did he take away your past? Why don't you give him your present as well? Do you, see what, do you see what he said here? Jesus is asking his disciples to do more than they had to do. Now, I've got a hard time sometimes doing that with my fellow man, but I shouldn't have a hard time doing that with my God. Mm -hmm. Verse 41. Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, you know the law requires me, God's word requires me to do some things, but there's some room for voluntary bonus devotion. Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. You know according to verse 41, God's word compels me to go a mile, but there is, there is room for me to sign up for a second mile that's not mandatory. Verse 42, give to him that asketh thee, I, I pay my tithes, and from him that would borrow thee turn not thou away. What if God wants more? What if he wants more than that? 
I think, I, I've talked with some of you this week, I think I'm talking to a group of people, Bible-believing, dedicated Christians that want to be sold out for God, Christians who've dedicated themselves and identified themselves with what some would call a pretty extreme group of Christians. Uh, many have called me an extremist. Our, our church, and I joke sometimes, the seven or eight churches in, you know, within 100 miles of us that agree with us, we're dinosaurs around the last mud hole. <laughs> and it just seems like a dying breed, as it were. And uh, look, look where we are on a Friday night. Look at how you're dressed. Doesn't look like you're going to a picnic at all. And uh, here we are in church. There's no rock band. There's no mood lighting. We've we've done all these things. We've identified ourselves. Our, our kids love their parents. If they don't, we have to. You know, we force them to act like they do. We homeschool or church school, and that's freaky. We minister in public. That you know, Westboro and all these things we get labeled. The most people we're out there. We're we're crazy. Something's wrong with us. And then every. Every Sunday you come into church and your pastor gets up and he basically says, let's go farther. Let's, let's go a little bit further. And that flesh says, and I know it because I've been there, that flesh says, I don't have to go any farther than this. I'm already so far out here that my family wants to have an intervention. I'm already so far out there that my neighbors are scared of me. They're not scared of the mosque, they're scared of me. But then you get to reading that Bible and you get to seeing how good God is and you respond to it. You start doing Doing something that God wants you to do and you give up something God wants you to give up and all of a sudden that spiritual side of you starts to get strong and that flesh side starts to get weak and that spirit says let's go farther let's let's do more let's try something forget door knocking let's go to the jungles let's go out and get the word of God somewhere here's a group of people I hope you know what we're talking about here we're talking about people who got so happy in the Lord that they fasted they got so full of joy they put on sackcloth. It makes no sense whatsoever to our flesh. It makes no sense. Yet you remember those early days. You, you remember those first few months after you got saved. I was, I was for other my grandparents, the first Christian, the only Christian still in my family. And I can remember, you know, son, what are you doing? I'm, I'm going to church. Come on now. Really, I'm going to church. And they said, man, something wrong with that boy. He's in trouble. Something wrong with him. Something's going on in his life. Nobody said you had to read the New Testament through in a week, but you wanted to. As soon as you found out what a tract was, you were on it. I mean, my, when I first got saved, I told you the other night, that old Dodge truck I had, had bumper stickers on the window, and bumper stickers on the tailgate, and, and a stack of tapes we listened to going down the road, and thousands of tracks scattered all over the seat, and, and uh, there was, you know, some fuddy-duddy comes up to you, and they says, you don't have to do that. You know, you don't really have to go that far. Of course we don't have to. We wanted to. Amen. Amen. Uh, you know, I, we wanted every one of our friends to know we're not with that crowd anymore. We're, we're not with you. We're one of the Christians. Now, I remember our first church, we had a, a, just a pile of people 18, 19, 20, early 20s that were just have just been saved and I remember some of the folks who've been there a long time, they went to the pastor and said, you really need to calm them down. And uh, thank God for some of those old ladies in church and, and they come up and come up beside you and say, keep it up son. Keep it. Don't you become what they are. You keep it up. Amen. And uh, they'd call my preacher from Outback Steakhouse in the, the mall there in Danville and they'd say you got to stop these people from putting all these pamphlets all over the place. We're finding them everywhere. And my pastor, he didn't have everything right, but he had this right. He said, well, who was it? Did you see them? And they'd say, no. He said, well, I can't tell them to stop. I don't know who it is. <laughs> and uh, But it's just something we wanted to do. Now, you please hear me. There are a lot of things that you can do for Jesus that you're not required to do. Why not go a second mile for the Lord Jesus Christ? Why not give up a cloak for the Lord Jesus Christ? You don't have to go to every church service. Why wouldn't you want to, though? You know, you don't have to go to church and make visits and go soul winning. Well, you know, visitation's not in the Bible. TV's not in the Bible. <laughs> Chili's not in the Bible. We have some good chili tonight. Walmart's not in the Bible. We do a hundred things every day that we live that's not in the Bible. Doesn't, why don't we do something for God we're not required to do? Why not just give the Lord what we used to give the world? Now watch, watch, watch what happens. Nehemiah, back to Nehemiah chapter 9. Headed somewhere tonight, Nehemiah chapter 9. Now the 20, uh, verse 1, Now in the 20 and 4th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting, with sackcloths, and with earth upon them. Wouldn't that be a sight? Imagine coming in Sunday and everybody's got dirt all over their head wearing burlap bags. <laughs> and the seed of Israel, verse 2, separated themselves from all strangers. Best I can find in the text, Nehemiah didn't preach that. 
Ezra didn't preach that. All they have been doing is reading the scriptures. They've been reading the law that God gave to Moses. That law said weird stuff. We talked about it the other night. You know, we're going to build this tabernacle and it's going to have so many ouches. I'm still not sure what that is. And, and uh, we're going to have curtains and hooks and ribbons and we're going to build this furniture and we're going to set up this table and we're going to put bread on that table and, and they're going to have this candlestick and these candles and these lights and all those things. That man is standing there reading these passages and the people are saying in their heart, what am I doing? What am I doing Facebooking with Canaanites? What am I doing being entertained with Babylonian entertainment? So where did all that come from that day? Where did this separation come from? Ezra's not up there preaching. Listen, you bunch of, bunch of reprobates. What are you doing all that worldly stuff for? He's not preaching that. What had happened is they stood there and they've listened now for eight straight days how great their God was and how powerful their God is and how wonderful their deliverance was and how glorious their salvation was and how fruitful this promised land was and how great their covenants were and their heart began to say, what am I doing? What am I doing pursuing relationships with people whose gods are dead? What am I doing? I want you to understand something tonight. If we would just, if we would just take God's word word to heart, we wouldn't need to hear preaching the way we do. Preachers, preachers are trying to accomplish and trying to allow God to use them to accomplish what the scripture ought to accomplish all by itself. How come the preacher's always up there preaching against sin? Because the people he's preaching to, probably including himself, are usually wrapped up in sin. And we have to preach prophesying messages, 1 Corinthians chapter number 14, I believe it is, exhortation, because many times we don't listen to the book. And this day, these people took the preacher's job away. You realize the Lord never sent prophets to Israel until they went into decline. You go read the law, read Joshua, those things. No prophets there. When they started declining, God had to send prophets in. Here they are now in Nehemiah chapter 9. They're standing in the street, sackcloth, fasting, dirt on their head. Spent seven days sleeping outdoors, branches woven together over top of them. And at the end of those days, that man stands up and reads the book. Let's, uh, let's look in Leviticus, Leviticus 23. Just for instance, you say, what is this? We could turn anywhere in the law. Just, let's just read what they're reading. This is, this is what their service is, what they're hearing. Leviticus 23, and uh, what is it, 40 some verses of it. Verse number 9. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then, shall, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath the priest shall wave it, and you shall offer that day when you wave the sheaf and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. We could keep reading 44 verses there. But let me let me read those verses for you, or at least say them to you as you'll read them after you've been saved for 15 or 20 years and you're just you know, sick and tired of serving God and you're just going through the motions. You ready? Here's how we read it. <sighs> got to bring a sheaf. I got to bring a sheaf to a priest. I can wave a sheaf as good as a priest can wave a sheaf. I've got to I've got to take one of my lambs and kill that thing for God. Why, why in the world do I have to do that? I'm already out of Egypt. I'm already in the Promised Land. Can I can I read it to you? Can I can I tell you how they heard it on this day in Nehemiah chapter number nine, verse ten? God gave us a land. Verse 11, God is accepting this offering rather than killing me for my sins. Verse 12, oh, a lamb. That's right. I was a slave for 430 years in Egypt until the blood of the lamb. What can I do for God? What can I give back to God? I hope you see the difference there. It's the same law. It just depends on the heart wherewith you hear it. And for hundreds of years, these people, whenever they heard the law, all they heard was, well, you can't do this and you can't do that. And you can't go here and you can't go there and you, you can't talk to those people and you can't spend time with those people and you can't do what they do. And I'm so sick of all these rules. That's what they heard. And then one day they got right with God. 
And all of a sudden now they're saying Moloch never saved anybody. Dagon never saved anybody. And all those gods in Egypt, they never, they never got us out of slavery. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a God we serve. Why would I want to hang around with these people? They separated themselves voluntarily because they understood the Scriptures. We okay so far? We know the command in 2 Corinthians 6 to be not only unequally, unequally yoked together and to separate from the world, separate, you know, what fellowship hath light with darkness, what concord hath Christ with Belial, what part hath he that believeth with an infidel. Now, if, if you please hear me, if you have a hard time separating from unrighteous people who walk in darkness after reading that scripture, I really can't help you. If you think that these commands of God are burdens and, and weights and a drag on your life, you know the Scriptures, but you don't understand the Scriptures. Do you not understand tonight that God wants us to have great gladness? It's not prosperity preaching. Joy and mirth at these people. And that's something the Canaanites don't have and the Egyptians don't have and the Babylonians don't have, which worldly people don't have. Why would I fellowship with those people whose gods are dead? Nehemiah chapter 9, now look at verse 2. Nehemiah chapter 9 again, back in verse 2. The Bible said, And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers, and stood and confessed their sins. It's pretty amazing. Three hours they did that. They heard the Word of God. They said, that was good. That was a good message. I mean, that was, that was, that was great. You know, that was, it wasn't as good as last week, but it's pretty good. It, it's, I want to get the CD of that. Man, Nehemiah and Ezra, they were, they were right on the money this week. No, that's not the way it happened. This time the preacher said, the service is over, you're dismissed, and from 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock, and from 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock, and then 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock, they talked to God about that message in their life and about that truth in their heart. You know what the Bible called it? Please look at your Bible in verse number 3. Look at the end of the verse. They confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. Now we, we just read that passage. It didn't say that they sang. It didn't say they shouted. It didn't say they waved their hands. It didn't say they played music or danced the holy dance. It said, they, it said they stood before God and they confessed their sins. And God says in His Word that that was worship. Here's, here's what I think they said, and I hope I can express this the way I need to. I believe they said, God, I've been a liar. Well, you know, what difference does that make? Unless also they said, and you're always true. And God, I've been unclean. Well, who hasn't been? But God, you're holy. But God, I, I, I've, I haven't even gone halfway for you. Well, who has? But God, you've gone all the way for me. I'm saved. I'm a Christian. All my sins are under the blood. I don't have to do any of that stuff. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to eat breakfast. You don't have to tie your shoes. You don't have to listen to the preacher. There's a lot of things you don't have to do. But I'm trying to tell us tonight, when these people begin to confess their sins, it resulted in a clear understanding of how sinless their God was. How without sin their God, how holy their God was. Of how pure their God was and clean that their God is. Of how righteous God is. And it turned into worship. Turned into worship. Now, I want to say something tonight that's true of my life, and it'll be true in yours. If you've lost heart, if you've lost zeal, if you're discouraged, if you're depressed, if you'll go somewhere and start telling God, thank you for everything that you can think of to thank Him for, and telling God you're sorry for everything you can think of to tell Him you're sorry for, the sun will not rise tomorrow without you having revival in your heart. I believe that all my life. That's what they did. They heard the Word. They confessed their sins. Verse 2. Can, watch this. This is a strange scripture. Verse 2. And confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. I, I don't think this is tattling on their dad. I believe what they did is that they acknowledged, you read about it in the rest of Nehemiah chapter 9, you can confirm it, but they acknowledged that they had developed a pattern of behavior based upon what they had been taught by those who taught them. And they got so right with God, they got so full of the Word of God that they stopped being satisfied with the status quo and the way things had been for decades and for centuries. And they said, we, we're going to keep this Feast of Tabernacles properly, even if we hadn't done it for a thousand years. Now here's where it gets a little tricky. 
tricky, at least in my own life. The flesh wants to compete. The flesh wants to be proud. You know, if a family gets up and sings harmony, that's wonderful. I praise the Lord for that. They're doing that for God and to honor Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful thing. But if they're doing that so then everybody can see how great of a family they are and how talented they are and how great parents they are, it stinks to high heaven. You know, if somebody testifies and tells what God's done for them and they're lifting up Jesus, it's a wonderful thing. I love to hear it. But if they're lifting up their own righteousness and preaching their own goodness, it's disgustingly nauseating. I don't smoke, I don't wear dresses, you know, or I wear dresses and I, I don't wear this and I, I don't listen to that type of music and, and I don't do this and I do that. If all your religion is what is what you do or what you don't do, I think it makes God nauseated. Look, if you don't eat sugar and your kids don't drink soda, praise the Lord. But if you start bragging about that, that somehow because of that you're better parents because your kids, you know, we've dealt with all kinds. You know, our kids don't use deodorant. They use baking powder and all that stuff. Wonderful. I've dealt with all. Bless God, we're really homeschooled and we don't use curriculum. True, but your kids can't read. <laughs> Call it, call it homing. There's not much school going home. Anyway, I won't preach that tonight. Here, here's what I am saying, though, is Baptist churches do things that Baptist churches have always done. A lot of it doesn't make any sense. A lot of it isn't really what we would call right. A lot of it's not scriptural. Preachers say things and preach things, and they're just things that have been passed down from generation to generation. I'm not trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater and change the whole church. I'm not all trying to do that. But a lot of people never looked them up. They never studied them. A lot of what you hear preached in a lot of places is just parroting what somebody else has said. We all right with that? Not, not a heretic or a liberal? Just because we've done it this way for 30 or 40 years, if we see in the Scriptures, I'm not talking about a, a website, if we see in the Scriptures that we've been doing it wrong, if we see in the Scriptures, you know, there's a more righteous way to do something, we ought to confess that we hadn't been right for 40 years and tighten it up. Is that okay? We don't have to continue to decline into apostasy. So I was talking with somebody the other day. It's a lot of a lot of guys and girls go off to Bible college. I'm not against that. I think it's a good thing. But uh, they're told for four years at many of these colleges, you know, we're the truth and we've got the truth and nobody else has got the truth and don't ever listen to anything else. And then they get out of college, they live for 50 years and they never learn anything else. Because everything they hear, you know, if it wasn't something they said at their Bible school or by somebody from that school, you know, it must be heresy and it can't be right and I can't listen to that. What a boring life it would be. Think of being 25 years old and being as smart as you're ever going to be. It'd be a rough life. But, you know, we've always done it this way. So what? They'd always kept the Feast of Tabernacles incorrectly, but this day they got it right. Mm -hmm. Some people allow the life of their parents to dictate their path. I, I can't tell you the people I deal with. There, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things that people have gone through or been brought up in, and I didn't have that kind of life, and so I don't understand it. I don't. I don't. I don't know exactly what to say. But here's what I do know. Are you listen. You can't ruin another thirty years of your life. And, uh, you know, by saying, I can't help it, my mom was a druggie. I can't help it, my dad was a drug. I was raised this way. It's all I've ever known. You, if you're saved, you know Jesus now. You know Jesus Christ. Confess the sins of your fathers. Don't wallow in them. Did your grandmother run off and leave her husband? Your mother run off and leave her husband? Did you get saved and find out now you're married to a guy you don't even know if you like him or not? <laughs> now, the fact that you've been taught by your parents or grandparents to violate the scriptures doesn't mean that you can't now have a wonderful marriage. Right. Doesn't mean, you know, confess the sins of your mother and get free from that thing. Mm -hmm. Men, I talk to them all the time. They say, man, I got a bad temper. I'm German. I've got a, got a bad temper. I'm Irish. I got a bad temper. I'm Italian. Are you human? Mm -hmm. You got a bad temper. <laughs> it's just what it is. It's got nothing to do with your genealogy. Right. I don't know how to raise these kids. Just don't know how to love these kids. My dad never said I love you. My dad beat me with a rod. He was like a, was like a drill sergeant. And, all right, fine. Confess the sins of your father. I don't buy the stuff that you've got to repeat the errors, that you've got to carry on in the generational curses. I don't buy it. These people got in that Bible and they went to one another and they said, they didn't, you know, they didn't keep this Feast of Tabernacles right in Solomon's day. They didn't keep it right in David's day. They didn't, they didn't keep this feast right in Saul's day. They didn't keep it right in the days of the judge. Well, you know, I guess there's no reason to start now. We've been doing it this way for all these years. No, here's what they said. They said, God... 
our, our dads didn't keep this right and our grandfathers didn't keep this right and uh, they didn't keep the Feast of Tabernacles right for all these generations. We haven't done this thing right. God help us. We're going to do it right this time. We're going to get it right this time. Do you see the difference there? I hope you do. There's a difference in sitting through the preaching of the Word of God and paying attention to the Word of God and responding properly to it. They went farther than they had to go. They went farther than their father or their mother went. I don't think any of you here know my testimony. I, I, don't, I don't share it very often because sometimes the life I lived before I got saved, I feel like almost, if I, if I get into too much, sometimes I feel like I'm glorifying what Satan did in my life. I, was, I went to church some growing up. I went to a very liberal church and liberal Baptist church, but... Um, Teenage years just got kind of wild and in and out of trouble and spent a lot of time in detention homes and things like that and drugs and alcohol and a lot of that. And, but I had a granddad named Jack Francisco that prayed for me. And the only Christian, only real Christian I ever knew. And uh, he prayed for me. He died before I ever got saved. But I was uh, out one night with who would soon be my wife and my friend was driving and a guy came by and stuck a gospel track in a car window. And uh, y'all got some of them back there, the chick tracks. This was your life. I remember how God wrecked my heart that night and told my friend, and I'd never cried in front of anybody that I remember. I'd just weep, and I said, you got to take me home. And I uh, went home that night and got saved in my grandmother's basement, and uh, my life's never been the same since. And, and uh, I know some of your preacher's testimony. I know a lot of people's testimonies. And I, I say this to the young people at our church, kids who were born in our church, who've been brought up in church. I'd say it to you tonight as well. And you know, you know nothing in your life but church. You should do so much more more than these men in this church who lived out in the world before they got saved. You should go so much further than these men have ever gone. You don't have their baggage. You don't have their memories. You don't have those things that haunt you at night and those temptations and that lure and that pull back to the world. You should confess their sins and say, God, I don't have to repeat their sins and then get right with you. Amen. Confess the sins of your father. We, we all love to hear those testimonies and I've had men have me to come in and share my testimony with youth, group, youth groups and we love to hear about them seem drug addicts and, and then the Lord saved them and thank God for the change that God makes in life. and I thank God for that I'm glad for the change he makes in life and people say man what a testimony and sometimes people sit and they hear things like that and they say man that's really a testimony I wish I had a testimony like that that's an exciting testimony I want to tell you what an exciting testimony is somebody stands up said I've never had a cigarette I've never tasted liquor never seen a page of pornography never you know, I, I was saved when I was seven years old, been in church all my life, and now I'm going to the mission field. That's an exciting testimony. Amen. That thrills my heart. Amen. And sometimes the thing I wish my kids could understand, sometimes the things in my mind, I'll just be going around the house sometimes or walking somewhere, and some song comes on in a store, and uh, songs that are very much not godly, and they get in my mind, and it's, you know, I didn't go to the internet and put that there that morning. It's just in there, and it won't get out of there until I get to heaven. You don't have to put that in you. You don't have to put that. You can do better than your father. You can do better than your pastor. Young ladies can do better than the women who trained them. You know, you know God, I, I love my dad. And my dad's told me about some sins in his life. God, help me to never do those things. God, I love my mother. And she's wept over some things she did when she was younger. Help me never to do those things. That's not condemning. That's not disgracing your parents or your pastor or whoever. That's saying, God, take me two miles, not just four. God, take my cloak also. I want to go further. These people went further than they had to go. Now watch your Bible there, verse 3. They stood up, they're still in their place. They read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day, and the other fourth part they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. They're spending some time. We're almost done tonight. There's, there's a lot of things we have learned since we got saved that we can do without backsliding. Things that, things that we can do without, you know, going out into the world. Things we can do and still, you know, speaking as far as most churches, be light years ahead of other churches. But we didn't used to do those things. Are you listening tonight? When we first got saved, we were so in love with God and so excited about the Bible and so burdened about lost people going to hell. We didn't used to get so tied up in all those things. And revival is, is when these people paid attention to the law that they have been hearing all their life. And finally, instead of just listening to it, they responded to it. 
And they stood for hours before God confessing their sins and separating themselves and worshiping the Lord. And the Bible said that there was mirth, there was joy, there was very great, great gladness. How about tonight, instead of saying, why do I have to? Or I, I don't have to do such and such. How about if we got back to those good old days when we said, God, I've been the mile you required me. Can I go one more? God, I've, I've given the coat the law required. Could I, could I give my cloak also? Is there anything else I can do? What if, what if tonight we're talking about revival? What if we just did more than we had to? And went further than we were required to go simply because God's worthy. I believe by definition that'd be revival. Wonder tonight, I want you to bow your heads with me for just a moment. Your preacher will come in just a second. Wonder tonight if maybe there'd be somebody that would join me around the altar and say, God, I wanna I wanna go that second mile. I don't want to just be satisfied with the status quo. I want to give my cloak also. Maybe you've been brought up in something and your family's instilled in you. Maybe it's just been something generational in your life that's hanging on to you. A good time to confess the sins and the iniquities of your father. And just say, God, I want to go further. I want to get closer. I want to do more than what's required. Maybe you join me in just a moment. We'll pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. I pray you take these thoughts as scattered as they seem they can be in my mind. And help us tonight, Lord. We sure need you. You've been so good to us. And Lord, we have been such a rebellious people. I know I have in my own heart sometimes. Just why do I need to do that? Why do I have to be this? Why that? And I question so much. Lord, help us to get back to those good old days of just responding when we hear the Word of God, just doing what the Bible says without question. And help us tonight. Help some folks to settle in their heart. I'm going to go further. I'm going to give more. I'm going to do more than I'm required to do just because I love you and you're worthy. Would you speak to hearts tonight and revive us? We we'll certainly thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, preacher. Mark, let's not have a song. Let's go ahead. Ladies, why don't y'all play? Let's stand. The altar's open. I think the preacher's made it clear. And hopefully the Lord has made it clear in your own heart what you need to do. And so uh, if you'll respond accordingly as the musicians play.
gives us something to think about, doesn't it? Yeah. Thank you, preacher. Thank you for being used to the Lord tonight. Why don't you and your wife make your way to the back and go by, please, and shake their hands. Offer plates in the back if you'd like to. Of course, led you to give in some way. Enjoyed having you here.